Welcome back to SuperCloud 7 here on theCUBE. I'm Paul Gillen. We're talking about data platforms, the emergence of new AI models and the platforms they run on. And someone who's been deeply invested in AI for a long time is Rudina Cesari, the founder and managing partner of Glasswing Ventures. Uh, so Rudina, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Paul. You have a long history in this, about 20 years of investment experience been focusing on AI since uh, 2010 when it was really just a an idea more than a more than a business and uh, if you go to the Glasswing Ventures website you'll see a long list of companies that uh, Rudina has invested in uh, many AI firms doing uh, doing leading edge stuff and um, I guess you know I'd like to ask given your longevity in this market what are some of the things and, and the sudden, you know, switch uh, fascination people have with, with large language models? What are some of the things people still don't understand about AI? Um, well, thank you so much for that question. I think uh, AI is being viewed largely driven by a lot of sort of mind share and news share as a monolithic notion. I have an AI company. I have an AI fund. Um, and I think it gets lost in that noise, the notion that AI is an output, meaning that, you know, it's delivering human-like intelligence by software or software and algorithms in, in, wrapped in a can, as I like to say, which is, you know, typically a device of sorts. That is not the, the how of it. That's the what and the output. The how of it, if we use um, really neural nets and deep learning and more broadly machine learning as the proxy for the how, it's only about 80% correct to do so, but for the purposes of this discussion, I think it's good enough. Um, an understanding that there are literally hundreds of architectures and sub-architectures, thousands of techniques that need to be leveraged or can be leveraged to deliver the intelligence or the output of AI, and they're extremely varied in nature. In fact, oftentimes you can combine architectures and techniques in, you know, what are called ensemble models. So saying AI is like saying technology. If you really want to understand, you need to go a few layers deeper in that regard. In fact, at Glasswing, we have created a framework, we refer to it as the AI palette, where literally we have mapped just some of the major architectures and sub-architectures and techniques and training um, approaches and then match them with the data sets and the use cases. So developing AI is quite complex and what goes into it is largely buried. Yes, and if you go to the Glasswing Ventures website, you'll see the palette. It's a very large model and there are many segments to it and, and large language models are only only a small part. Uh, can you speak about outside of generative AI, there are many other types of AI, what are some types of, of AI that your companies, your, that you've invested in, are actually using now that are actually generating revenues and changing industries? Thank you, yes, happy to. Some, um, so, you know, if you think about generative AI, if I were to speak to it in the context of the you know, the enablers, you're really talking about um, transformer and attention, um, you know, technologies and methods. Aside from those, though, we have, I can think of an architecture called recurrent neural nets, where it is a type of deep learning architecture. And basically what you can do is train it. So you can move the data bidirectionally. It has memory. It's very, very powerful. And within it, you have, you know, sub-architectures and techniques like PINs, one of my favorites, you know, which stands for Physics Informed Neural Nets, where you can fundamentally bring the boundaries of the physical world to the algorithms to mirror and simulate the physical world with incredible ramifications ranging from life sciences to oil and gas to physics and chemistry and biology, anything that involves formulas. That is has nothing to do um, with Gen AI, but it's, you know, it's one of many, many, many examples of what else is happening in the AI world. Uh, as enterprises, uh, as enterprise CIOs look at AI now and as it becomes a priority item for them, many are wrestling with the, with the issue of data quality and uh, the data duplication and just data proliferation throughout their enterprise. Do you see this as a solvable problem? 
very much so and and it's the right problem to solve um as the thread of our conversation has underscored there is there are multitudes of possibilities around algorithmic and um, machine learning type approaches that one can take. The real key is um, the data. In fact, you know, at Glasswing, we're thesis driven. So one of our thesis is the data foundations. We're not focusing on the you know foundation models. We're focusing on the data foundations. And really, what that means is how to make the data cheaper, better, faster. So with a CIO hat on, data quality is one very, very big component of, you know, how do you manage your data and how do you ensure that it's high quality data in, high quality output rather than junk in, junk out. Um, to that end, we've actually made an investment in a company called Telmi, Telm.ai, for, you know, but they pronounce it, the founders pronounce it as Telmi. And what they are doing is squarely in the data quality focus, where they're not just taking samples from the data that's getting fed, whether it's in AI models or other use cases, um, but instead, I think of them as a riverbed. They see the entire magnitude of all sort of data um, that flows through, and in real time, they're able to detect anomalies. Um, around the quality of data. And the fact that we've made an investment in in the space, and in particular in, in Telmi, after having looked at a number of opportunities, at least in our view, speaks to the large opportunity that exists for this very real problem, including budget availability, and the fact that, again, we believe Telmi is the team um, to, that's building the right platform. But considerations from cheaper, better, faster, you know, how do you deal with, you know, are you putting your data in data bricks versus snowflakes and others? And, you know, where, how does that all tie in the big picture, but also the sheer quality of the data, because ultimately that is your differentiating asset for the models and the AI outputs. Uh, so you, you mentioned data bricks and snowflakes and, and the snowflake and the various options that uh, customers have for, for the platforms they use. Do you see any kind of a standardized AI infrastructure stack emerging? Less on the data bricks and the snowflake side, more at least on the Gen AI side, I think. Uh, and, and we can talk about where data bricks and, and the likes fit in, but definitely in Gen AI, we're seeing a, a clear tech stack. So, you know, below the software line, if you will, or, you know, in the hardware category, of course, you have the NVIDIAs and then related players. I think in many, many ways, especially around Gen AI, Nvidia has turned out to be a gigantic winner, and that's not simply, at least in the in the short to medium term, and that's not simply by looking at once uh, you know public stock price, but also just looking at the spending. If you think about all the Gen AI companies that are gen generating the large language models, collectively, um, you know, they have generated about five billion on an annualized basis. We could even be generous and say that they're getting to ten billion. If you look at how much those companies and related have spent on NVIDIA, it's north of 50 billion. So numbers speak for themselves. But back to the tech stack, I think above the hardware infrastructure, we have the foundational models or the software infrastructure. And those are, you know, the OpenAI slash Microsoft, Anthropic, Mistral, um, Google's Gemini and others. Um, and they have interesting characteristics that in fact, um, mirror what we saw in the cloud with their own sort of unique twist. And what I mean by that is that it has, the, the category has oligopoly-like um, dynamics, few players, extremely capital intensive, where capital is really the main differentiator in getting these models off the ground and fundamentally dominated by incumbents. And you might say, wait a minute, you know, Anthropic, OpenAI, Mistral, and others are new names, and that's very true. But if you look at who has largely invested in these companies, it's been the incumbents, whether it's, you know, Amazon, you know, billions in Anthropic, to Microsoft buying half of OpenAI and so on, as well as some very, very large um, multi-stage VC funds in the billions again. So very capital intensive. And I think what remains to be seen is their long-term differentiation. 
I can somebody say with some level of conviction and reason, reasonable argument, why open AI is better than anthropic, you know, in different models and different plays, they will try to differentiate against each other, but they're ultimately, if the web data is the biggest source of data and they're all getting trained on the same models, there might be subtle differences long-term, but I'm not convinced that there will be highly differentiated outcomes. So it's really a play of incumbency, you know, you have your installed base and you grow from there, but really, really sort of using capital and the capital intensity that these businesses require as a barrier to entry. And again, the reason I draw the analogy to the cloud is because we saw what happened with AWS and GCP and Azure and, you know, and the, who dominated that category. Again, in the AI sort of arena or gen AI in particular, we have this dynamic that it might be seeming startups, but really it's the incumbents behind them. And again, while there are dif differences between Azure and AWS, it really it comes down to an ecosystem buy and what else you get and why you're tied into one platform versus the other. Um, another important distinction perhaps in this category of software infrastructure is that um, open source is playing a much more important role than it previously um, has. In a, in a prior podcast, um, I made the case at the beginning of this year that um, 2024 will be the year of open source for large language models and possibly, you know, Meta being the company that capitalizes on that. Um, I am more convinced today than ever that that is turning out to be the case. And I think it will be interesting to see how the dynamics shift and what the open source community will do around foundation models. But moving sort of up the stack, um, the next layer is what I would call the middle layer. Um, and that's where I would place back to your question, the data bricks of the world, as well as other platforms that um, sort of are ser serving or tying that bridge between what the foundation layer models are providing and the app application layer providers. The interesting bit there is going to be you have cloud companies like Databricks and Snowflake that sort of are, have reinvented um, themselves to really respond to this AI wave and others that are emerging. If one makes it in the middle layer, they make it big. However, relative to other categories, the risk of being commoditized for this um, profile players is also very high, particularly when it comes to the you know, bottom layer or foundation model layer um, incumbents releasing similar tools. And then at the top, you have the application layer providers. A number of the ones that will be successful, it's my view, have their own middle layer and application layer. So it's sort of, if you leave out the software infrastructure bucket out, they provide their own tech stack end to end. At least in the foreseeable future, those are the ones that have huge differentiation. But there are other application layer companies that are really are leveraging sort of thin wrappers and speed of go to market that are making a go at that. But that's how I see the tech stack for Gen AI. Uh, th you, uh, of course, LLMs are not the the be all and end all of generative AI. There are also small language models, hugging faces, hosting hundreds of thousands of them. What impact do you believe those will have on this on this generative AI category? Yeah. So as, as as I laid out the um, the tech stack as as I view it and as we view it at Glasswing, you know when I said the companies that have their own middle layer, all the way to the application layer, I was encompassing in that um, the small language models. I think having your own small language model is quite powerful um, because what it does it it takes what is an otherwise general model and really gives you the specificity of output and performance that one needs, especially if one is taking a vertical approach um, or solving very, very specific problems, but for large market opportunities. If one wants to be the differentiated, sort of beyond even fine tuning, I think small language models are a very viable path to do so. So as you look out uh, on the horizon, what comes after generative AI? So it will be interesting, um, you know, again, uh, rather than which, because generative AI, you know, while we all became aware, is by we all, I mean, 
the mass market, not necessarily, uh, you know, ourselves, because our first gen AI investment was in 18, but, you know, generative AI models have been developing um, since 2017 when the paper came out of the University of Toronto. So they've taken quite some time. I mean, um, even sort of open AI, which really brought it to the mass market, it's not like they started with that. They adopted it and then hit uh, the market. So the question is going to be um, in terms of what next. Is it going to be a combination of, you know, generative AI type model with the other architectures? We're seeing quite a bit of that. Um, what also, what does it mean, you know, like we believe post gen AI integration with other models and perhaps a little bit of a takeover, at least on the user interface and user experience of gen AI over the other architectures, we're going to move into ambient AI, meaning that you have a co-pilot um, of sorts in your, if it's the individual or the enterprise, it almost doesn't matter, but perpetually wherever one goes to drive higher productivity, higher efficiency, more creativity for the freed up sort of time of the human. So the question, you know, that follows that is how, how does that ambient AI get delivered? Is it a bunch of agents? talking to each other, perhaps? Is it one sort of um, Uber agent for each individual? Is it powered by one group? Is it powered by, uh, you know, different angels and someone, agents and someone that sits on top of the stack? TBD. But we're still in the early, early innings of the current stage that I think um, agent or ambient AI better put um, adoption is 5, 10, 15 years in the future, but definitely, in our view, a path that we're heading toward. So at the risk of asking you, you know, which of your children you like the most, are, are, are there a couple of companies you invest in, that, in, in AI that you think are doing some really exciting things? Well, you know, just like with children, I love them all, but it depends who's been least problematic. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So... Um, uh, let me let me think. I I referenced a, a particular type of um, sub architecture pins um, earlier in the conversation, where I said it brings the found, uh, the boundaries of the physical world to algorithms. So perhaps I will riff off of that. We have made an investment in a company called Base Two Dot AI, which fundamentally is leveraging pins and um, overall sort of recurrent neural nets to bring precision and equally importantly, cost optimization in process manufacturing. So if you think about, you know, drug um, manufacturing, um, any kind of compound additives for um, aerospace, like different industries, anything in chemicals, because they're formula driven, at scale, these formulas don't necessarily scale linearly. So what process manufacturing engineers have to do is very much a trial and error, pen and paper-like, and I say that in air quotes, um, you know, approaches or very old legacy solutions to try to gen generate, you know, the 20, 30, 40, 50 million type productions where they can take very, very little risk. Um, and even so, they can't deliver consistency at 100% accuracy from production to production, even if it's the same drug in the same manufacturing site by the same engineer. So what Base2 has done is leverage pins to actually deliver that accuracy and more importantly, to find points of optimization. So, and again, it, this is the beauty of AI. Well, previously we could, you know, they this industry in particular was limited in, you know, finding efficiencies with AI. You can solve a problem that was previously unaddressable to actually not just find some efficiency, but to drive optimization. And how one do, does that is one can highly accurately simulate the production and realize that by letting the production go for another 5, 10, 15 extra hours to be sure that you got it right, you're actually not gaining much. So all of a sudden, you know, energy being typically the biggest cost driver, you can run the production for a shorter amount of time using less energy, less fewer materials, and the output is even higher accuracy and optimization. So that's an example where it's, it's a, you know, almost vertically focused example, but where AI can make a real difference. Another example, perhaps, um, I'll pick on, on the security side, we have a portfolio company called Black Kite. 
which is focused on the um, third party risk category. A lot of the most famous attacks or infamous, I should say, attacks happen through by way of the relationships that any enterprise has with third party trusted vendors. And um, what Black Kite has done is basically leveraged embeddings within the transformer world to create many, many, many dimensions, you know, think of vector math across many dimensions um, as, as the backbone of, of the AI engine and platform that they have built. And they incorporate the MITRE framework and another, you know, and another set of um, security frameworks that are well understood to then look from the outside in and assess the vulnerabilities that enterprises have as a rely as a to assess the vulnerabilities that enterprises have as a result of their trusted partner, third partner relationship, be those customers, vendors, partners, et cetera. And they don't just say, here's a rating, now go figure it out. They actually are prescriptive in nature, which again is another facet of AI and um, AI done well. So now the CISO can take that recommendation. Not only can they address questions for the governance purposes and the board of directors, but actually take action either to mitigate risks on their own within their organization or ask a vendor to do so. And that's incredibly powerful. And in all of these examples, there is a facet of Gen AI in the UI, UX aspect of it, but that's more what I referred to earlier as the thin wrapper. The differentiation actually comes from, you know, the underpinning techniques. And again, it's interesting because in the case of Black Kite, they use embeddings, but not necessarily um, attention, at least on, on that facet of the, you know, of the technology. Do those two examples give you a flavor? And it's, yes, clearly examples of how we go beyond generative AI and how AI with particularly uh, recurrent neural networks, as you talk about uh, the uh, deep learning uh, is being used in practical situations right now that, that really have nothing to do with, with Gen AI. Um, we are about out of time. We could go on about this for a long time, but encourage you to visit the Glasswing Ventures website. Look at some of the companies they're investing in, but also check out the palette. It's a very uh, detailed description of uh, or a picture of the AI market and you'll see what Radina has been talking about some of the uh, many different nuances and flavors of AI other than than generative. Radina Cesare, general manager, founder of Glasswing Ventures, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us and look forward to our next conversation. This is SuperCloud 7 on the Cube. I'm Paul Gillen. Stay with us.